Hi, I'm Dennis Green, and this is kind of a special uh, extra edition Culture Crawl for this week, as I am uh, pleased to welcome uh, writer, director, uh, Hollywood legend, we'll go with that, uh, and University of Iowa alumnus, Nicholas Meyer. Nick, welcome to uh, KCCK. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, it's it's great to have you here. You're you're here as uh, making some uh, appearances in Iowa City, like you do occasionally, and also to be a part of ICON, which is the uh, uh, Eastern Iowa Science Fiction Convention. I haven't seen you, excepting the lecture last night, since uh, 1979, when I was in the audience and you premiered Time After Time at the Old Hancher Auditorium. That's correct. Um... It never got to be the old Hancher Auditorium. It was <laughs> it was drowned before that happened. That but that was one of the great nights of of my life uh, to come back to my school with a movie and and premiere it in because it was a state of the art uh, theater and uh, there was an old time car parade beforehand and there were fireworks afterwards and then we were all at the president's house having i don't know what booze i'm sure um it was great fun and it was like the smartest audience that was ever going to watch my movie <laughs> it was 3000 really smart people so they got every joke i and i, I to this day that's that's something that was a huge that was a, one of my huge experiences when i was in college and then again to have that experience of oh my gosh this guy went to college here and wow look at him and this was of course before it was before star trek it was before the day after, yeah. uh, you know, there was there was so much yet to come that uh, that was maybe the first time people made a really, really big deal of you someplace. Outside my mother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, you know, I want to hit a few of uh, the, you know, a few of kind of the the touch stones of uh, of your career. But I, I kind of want to work backwards. Um, let's start with the day after. Uh, which, of course, I think most people, re you know, will remember, uh, was the, um, the ABC miniseries about. It wasn't uh, a miniseries. Mi one night. Oh, it was just one night. Gosh. Okay. It uh, it seemed it seemed longer at the time, but it was it was a uh, TV. It was, it was originally supposed to be two nights. Okay. Uh, uh, it it's a movie about a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it was set in Lawrence, Kansas, and. It's, it's it's not about the military. It's not about politics. It's not about Washington. It's just about people like us who get nuked. And um, they picked Lawrence as the sort of geographical crosshairs of the continental United States. But it reminded me a lot of Iowa City, actually, Lawrence. Um, I think the same guy painted all the street signs <laughs> in both places. Um, and it was originally supposed to be two nights. And I just said, I... I don't think anybody's going to tune in for night two of Armageddon. Why don't we just like zap everybody between the eyes for one night? So it became a one night thing because all the sponsors ran away. So they had no sponsors and then they didn't care how the shorter, the better. Did you have a sense while probably not while maybe not while you were making it, um, but as you know, as as air date as the air date came closer and closer, did you have a sense of that was going to be the most watched made for television well, of all time. I was going to talk no, about No, I did not. Probably not. Yes. No. Uh, did you did you feel the controversy? The did you sense oh, that was coming or oh, the controversy proceeded? You know, we barely made it on the air. I had editorials, you know, calling me a traitor and saying, "Why is Nicholas Meyer doing Yuri Andropov's work for him?" Yuri Andropov being the then Soviet premier. Um, in fact, it was it was all the controversy I think that made the movie the hit that it was, because um, it remains with a hundred million people in one night, the most watched movie ever made for television. And since there's so many channels now, I win. Yeah, that will uh, ne that will never happen again. Yeah, you know, it will not. And you know, as far as did I know, did I anticipate? No, not at all. I was watching the movie the night it went on with my fiance and I said be honest if you know if, if if you weren't my girlfriend would we be sitting through this and I couldn't imagine the next day when they said that a hundred million people had watched it that was just 
the last thing on my mind. And there was one particular audience member that it reached. Yes, after the movie was on the air, the, the day after the day after, so to speak, the press ran out with their microphones to say, did this movie change your mind about nuclear war one way or the other? And then came rather gleefully back to tell me that according to their day after surveys, the movie hadn't changed anybody's mind one way or the other, hadn't moved the needle. But as it turned out, uh, the movie did change one person's mind, more or less overnight. Uh, and that was Ronald Reagan, the president of the United States, who subsequently wrote about it in his memoirs and, and in Edmund Morris's uh, biography, Dutch, which was he lived in the White House for three years while he was writing this biography. And he said the only time he ever saw Ronald Reagan flip out was after he saw the movie. And eventually, remember the Reagan administration came into office believing in a winnable nuclear war. You know, 20 million, 30 million dead, that was acceptable, whatever that's supposed to mean. And eventually the, the movie really shook him up and ultimately sent him to Reykjavik, Iceland, to sign the Intermediate Missile Range uh, uh, Nuclear Treaty with uh, Premier Gorbachev, who just died. And um, that's the only treaty that actually resulted in the dismantling of nuclear weapons in the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, the pussy grabber-in-chief has since walked out on that one. So... <laughs> Another, another positive blow for diplomacy. <laughs> um, uh, so Star Trek is the big elephant in the room, especially uh, amongst us, uh, us sci-fi Elephants. geeks. Yes. And um, so you, I know that from reading your, and I, and I read View from the Bridge, which is your really fun autobiography, uh, and you, you know, say often that you didn't really know much about Star Trek. When I didn't you know anything about it. it. Uh, but now you've kind of spent half your life with this property and these characters. Why do you think it has such longevity? Well, I should preface my answer by saying, you know, I, I know many things, but I understand very few. Um, people are always having to explain things to me. And I should also preface my answer by uh, putting it out there that I, I, I suspect artists are not the best judges of their own work. Um, and Tchaikovsky really disparaged the Nutcracker. Arthur Conan Doyle didn't get why Sherlock Holmes was more popular than his historical novels. It took me a long time because I, I didn't know anything about Star Trek. And I had never watched it. And I, I saw the man with the pointy ears and the cheesy sets. And I just kept going. So I think it's fair to say that I I missed everything important about the show. I missed the interracial, international cast. I missed women operating in positions of power. I missed all the idealism that is fundamental to, I think, in answer to your question, why the show is so popular. Because whether you subscribe to this notion or not, Star Trek puts forth the idea that different people of goodwill can come together to achieve things. It's almost inspired by Tolstoy's line that if evil men can band together to get what they want, why can't good men and women and whatever band together to get what they want? And in, in Star Trek, they do. So I think that may be account for its longevity, its idealism. Uh, in the, I, and I should have prefaced this for the, those of us in the audience who are, of a slightly less, uh, who, who are less expert in Star Trek than some of us within these walls are, but uh, you took over with the second movie, Star Trek II, uh, and uh, then uh, were involved in Star Trek IV, and then also Star Trek VI. So you're the guy who they, who, when we say, people say the even, uh, even ones are the best, that's you. Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. I either wrote and or directed those three. 
the other uh, character that, of course, you'll always be identified with is Sherlock Holmes because your first movie and first book and first movie was the uh, 7% solution. See, I told you we we're going to go through and work backwards okay. uh, to some extent. Uh, kind of the same question. Why is uh, why is Sherlock Holmes, why is that still the fandom is so huge and we keep, you know, you keep telling those stories and making new ones as you have done again and again about that character? Well, I think it's an interesting uh, question. I think Sherlock Holmes is probably some lineal descendant of Don Quixote. Um, he is a kind of a knight errant. And like Quixote, by the way, he's a deducer. Quixote will tell you that a windmill is really a giant, and he's uh, accompanied by a, a sort of credulous sidekick, Sancho Panza. And Watson is sort of, you know, a combination of savvy but naivete at the same way. He's always, and I think Sherlock exists, unlike Quixote, in a world that is long enough ago to have a sort of fairy tale quality to it, but recent enough that we recognize the world. It's a world with automobiles and trains and telephones and telegraphs. Um, so, and, and perhaps an idealized version of a world we choose to believe is simpler and better run, even though on closer examination, there's racism, there's anti-Semitism, the same old crap that we live with all the time. But I think that it, it's a kind of a lay Bible in a way. There are 60 Sherlock Holmes stories, 56 short ones and four novellas, and they cover everything. They cover drug addiction, they cover the mafia, they... They cover interracial marriage. They cover all kind of things. And Sherlock sort of sorts it out for us. And he, he isn't always right. Sometimes he fails. And that adds to his credibility, I think, for us. And probably, you know, his descendant is Batman and Robin or something. <laughs> well, I, I, I recall in Star Trek VI, you, uh, you made him an ancestor of Spock. Too. So you you linked the you managed to link the two canon together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, staying with the with with Sherlock for a minute at the today, of course, fan fiction and remixes and you know for every character that exists, someone is wanting to write a story about them. Or that's not you know, new. Do, yeah, not not new at all. all but it, but all, it, all art is a history of cut and paste. The Odyssey is a fanboy sequel to the Iliad. The Aeneid is a fanboy sequel to The Odyssey. So everybody keeps adding um, all fiction is fan fiction. You were one of the, not probably not the first, but you were an early person, though, to take a character like Sherlock Holmes and write a new adventure in the, you know, in the, in the original style. Well, I... I'm not really. Um, there were imitations and parodies and ripoffs of Sherlock from the moment he began to be popular. I, I when the Seven Percent Solution, which was the first of my discovered Watson manuscripts, was published, there had there had been a lot and many many movies. Maybe it was the sort of tongue and cheekiness of it. Sherlock's teaming up with Sigmund Freud, with with Freud turning into a kind of an action hero. Um, maybe it took people by surprise. <laughs> it sure took me by surprise. You, uh, of course, the you know that generated the movie. But you, as you just said, you went on to write more Sherlock Holmes book, and then the most the last one you put him in Egypt. Yes, there's an, the last one is The Return of the Pharaoh, which is out now, which is Holmes and Watson in Egypt in 1911, um, during the archaeological mania by rich col colonials who just thought there was a fortune under the sands waiting to be discovered. And in fact, in that sense, they were right. The one before that is called The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols, 
And that's about Sherlock versus the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And the learned elders of Zion is the most famous, destructive, and vicious forgery of all time. And it was put out in around 1903 by the Okrana, the secret police of the Tsar. And it purports to be the minutes of a secret meeting of Jews plotting to take over the world. And they've never really gone away, no matter how many, how long they've been debunked. I mean, Henry Ford lost his newspaper after reprinting them because he got sued for libel. But Vladimir Putin quotes them, and they're, and they're taught as authentic in uh, schools in the Middle East. Um, but they're fake. Um, and they're actually... <laughs> They're actually a plagiarized fake, which is even weirder. Um, so that's what that book is about. And then there's another one that I'm writing now, which would be number six, Sherlock Holmes and the Telegram from Hell. <laughs> well, I won't ask you to spoil any of that. Um, Good, because uh, I don't know. <laughs> it hasn't, ha haven't figured that part out yet. Speaking of uh, present day, present projects, though, you had for the longest time, now for those who, again, for those who need some background, uh, the Star Trek Wrath of Khan movie was the sequel to one of the uh, TV episodes with Ricardo Montalban as, uh, as Khan. And um, for a long time, you had in development... Uh, you know, a middle series that explained what happened to that character. CD Alpha 5. Between the time he was marooned by Kirk and the time he was rediscovered. It's now coming as a podcast. Yeah, so tell me about Paramount. that. Yeah. Well, I never understood why the three scripts that I wrote, and it, it wasn't my idea, it was Alex Kurtzman's idea, but I just thought, oh, I know how to do this, and I had a great time doing it. And then it wasn't done, which most screenplays aren't for one reason or another. Um, and now they've gone into the mothball closet and pulled them out and said, let's make this into a, a radio play series. And I said, well, I used to direct a play a week on WSUI in Iowa City, so I'm the perfect person to do this. So they said, fine, you're on. So when I, when I get back to L.A. from talking to you, that's what I'm going to work on. So, the, um, so you haven't produced the episodes yet? Nope. Are they written? Well, the three original screenplays are written. Oh, okay. Now sure. I have to adapt sure. them for the radio. Okay, so you have to adapt them yet. And then and they have come to out. cross my palm with silver before I do it, too. <laughs> and uh, and the perfect thing, of course, now with a lot of audio productions yeah. coming out as podcasts, it's the, the perfect time. Uh, so there's the podcast coming up. Uh, another Sherlock Holmes book is yeah. in the works yep. um what else what what haven't you done that you'd like to do well i think with a few exceptions it's safe to say that all my best screenplays have never been filmed <laughs> i wrote the rise of theodore roosevelt for martin scorsese that didn't get made i wrote the power broker for oliver stone that didn't get made and i love my screenplay um called the crook factory uh, which is based on a dan simmons novel that's not been made so yeah there are a few if you live long enough which is an open question in my case uh you you'll probably get to see some of these things happen in one form or another you can write a screenplay i i wrote two philip roth adaptations and the the one that was based on his novella the dying animal and i said you know that's not going to pass the saturday night test you know honey you want to see the dying animal? I don't think so. So I changed the title. I called it Elegy. And they filmed it with Ben Kingsley and Penelope Cruz and it was Dennis Hopper's last film. But I for, you know, I turned it in and didn't hear anything for five years. And then the phone rings and they're saying, yep, we're making the movie. So you just have to stay in good health. Nicholas Meyer is uh, in Iowa for a few days. He's going to be guest of honor at uh, ICON, which is the uh, Iowa Science Fiction Convention. It's uh, this weekend at the Marriott in Cedar Rapids. And uh, be uh, talking about this and a lot uh, more stuff uh, as well. Um, uh, Nick, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you a lot closer than the last time I saw you. And uh, thank you for coming in today. And I hope you have an enjoyable time in Iowa this weekend. It's good to be here. And thank you for inviting me today. Thanks again, Nick.